Massimo, good to see you. Hey, it's a pleasure, my friend. Uh, welcome to the Sofia audience. Um, uh, I am Daniel Kaufman, professor of philosophy at Missouri State University, and... And I am Massimo Pilducci, the KD Irani professor of philosophy at City College of New York. And um, I'm really glad to see you again. Uh, it feels like it's been a while. Yes. I should just tell the audience, um, in case they notice, so I've suffered a bit of a mishap. Um, I had a pretty nasty uh, intersinal infection, so ear and then upper respiratory, and one of the effects of it was that it gave me a temporary paralysis on the side of my face, which is why you'll notice only one side of my mouth is moving. <laughs> when I laugh, I do this because I look like Two-Face from Batman. Um, well, but that's, that's a pretty cool villain, so <laughs> right, this is right. good. Except that he's a homicidal maniac, of course. <laughs> Um, but, um, so if at any point I slur a little bit and you need me to repeat, please say so. So it's not because you're drunk? No, no, alas. Okay. It's 10 in the morning here, so that would be a bit much. Um, All right. So, um, Massimo, today we're going to talk about something really interesting. Um, it's a very uh, important paper by the philosopher Wilfred Sellers. Um, and let me get the exact title of it so I don't bungle it. Um... It's philosophy. It's called philosophy and the scientific image of man, right? And it was based on um, two lectures that were given at the University of Pittsburgh uh, in 1960. And um, the paper is very interesting in that I would argue it's both very influential and almost completely ignored. Um, I think um, you're right. <laughs> um, so I know people on whom it's had a tremendous influence. Somebody, one of your colleagues, David Rosenthal. Um, is a big Seller, Sellers fan, and Rosenthal is a major player in consciousness and of that, that related series of areas in the philosophy of mind. He also is a professor of mind when I was at the Graduate Center. Um, so there's a number of people, I think, who would cite Sellers as a major influence in this paper as being one of the reasons, but he also is not one of the people that's typically brought up in the history of analytic philosophy. He's not brought up in the way that a Quine or a Hilary Putnam or even a Kripke is brought up. Um, and I wonder maybe some of the reasons will come out in the discussion of the paper. The paper is, is quite difficult. Yeah. Um, and, yeah. um, but I think, I think, Massimo, see if you agree with me, it provides a really remarkable framework within which to express a whole number of problems that I think um, is really useful. Yeah. No, I completely I agree. So I, I didn't study Sellers in graduate school, um, and, and uh, I actually came across the distinction between uh, scientific and, and uh, manifest image, of which we will talk about in a few minutes. Uh, I think reading Dan Dennett, of all, of all things. In fact, uh, I think we should go back to Dennett as well. Yeah. Um, and, uh, and then I sort of eventually traced back the, the source, and, and when I read the paper, I said, holy crap, this is really good stuff. Um, and I think you're right. Everybody in the analytic tradition uh, and possibly beyond sort of recognizes Sellers' importance, but his name doesn't come up as a, it hasn't become an household name. Although, uh, reading, rereading recently the entry about Sellers in the Stanford Encyclopedia of Philosophy, uh, I agree with, with the claim of the author there that actually there's been a revival of, of interest in Sellers' yeah. ideas and therefore hopefully uh, in, in you know, his, his broader philosophy. I actually would go as far as saying that when I read Sellers' stuff, I, it, it, a lot of things for me clicked because as you know, and as is probably our, our, some of our viewers at least know, uh, my background is a dual one in, in science and philosophy, and so ever since I've moved professionally to philosophy, I looked for a sort of a framework uh, from within which makes making sense of my two careers, as well as my two different ways of looking at the world, right, like as a philosopher and as a scientist. And I think that Sellers actually offers a pretty much perfect, uh, ready-made uh, sort of framework, and I would go as far as saying that actually Sellers, to me, uh, make helps make sense of what the the whole point of modern philosophy actually is, hmm. and th that may be going f further than, than maybe even you want to want to go. But uh, I think there is something to be said there uh, on on that behalf. And uh, of course, you know, no 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 individual thinker has the last word ever. So I'm sure there are certain things that that um, we'll need to revise and, uh, and and improve upon. But I think that Sellers' contributions really ought to be taken seriously and be more widely known, which is why we're having this conversation to begin with. Yeah, I, I would say, I mean, 
tell me if you think this is maybe part of the reason that part of the reason for the revival of fortunes of sellers and particularly this piece is because people have become increasingly frustrated with the seeming the seeming intractability of the reduction pro the reduction program right. um, um, and they're looking for other ways and 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 the sort of the appeals to supervenience have seen seem less than satisfying insofar yeah. as they really don't say very much other yeah. than that you know um, you know two, one thing supervenes on another if you were to replace one particle by particle you, you wind up with the same thing um, right. which doesn't say very much about the relationship between the two no um, in fact it says very little and yeah. so that you're, I think you're right that one of the problems here is that on the one hand again as a scientist you know if you were to tell me well, this conversation that we're having is made possible by the laws of physics, and it's 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 really a bunch of atoms, you know, sort of swirling around and all that. I would say, yeah, sure, of course, but that tells me nothing about the conversation. It tells me nothing about you as a person, or yeah. about me as a person, or as professional philosophers, right. or what we're talking about. So, uh, yeah, in a sense, that's true. It's, it's I would say at this point, it's trivially true, um, but it's not helpful at all. Right. And so, so the question is, how do you reconcile as uh, you know, the, the, the scientific view or image, as Sellers put it, of the world with the manifest image or, or the, the, the uh, understanding, the evolving understanding of the world that we have as some simply thinking human beings. So perhaps we should sort of summarize... Yeah, go ahead. Why don't you go ahead and tell me how you see the difference. So the, the major distinction in this paper, and we'll link to the paper, obviously, that Sellers makes is between what he calls the manifest image and the scientific image. Right. And maybe why don't you give your account of what you think it is, and if I agree entirely, I'll just nod, and if, and if I think that something needs to be added, I'll say so afterwards. Well, I'll begin actually with a quote from Sellers himself, and then with a, it's very short, and then with a short commentary immediately following that quote by, uh, in the, the, that you can find in the, in the, set, the, the standard Stanford Encyclopedia, a philosophy article. Then I'll tell you what I think about it, and then, and then we okay. can... Okay, sounds good. For now. So the quote from Sellers is, the aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term, unquote. Uh, the commentary from the... Therefore, philosophy... Wait a minute, you're freezing. I... Hold on, hold on, hold on. You just froze. Oh, that's too bad. That's all right. Um, now you're back. Okay, start, start to quote after hanging together. Philosophy in the broadest sense is how things hang together. In the, okay. So the aim of philosophy, abstractly formulated, is to understand how things in the broadest possible sense of the term hang together in the broadest possible sense of the term, unquote. Now the uh, Stanford article adds, um, therefore philosophy is a reflectively conducted higher order inquiry that is continuous with, but distinguishable from any of the special disciplines, including, therefore, the sciences, and the understanding it aims at must have practical force guiding our activities, both theoretical and practical. So, I take this to mean that uh, what we, what Sellers was aiming at, and what he thought the point of philosophy, uh, in, a mo in modern philosophy, is, is to develop sort of a stereoscopic vision where we can see simultaneously and, and sort of integrate in a, in a, in a, uh, in a good way, in a, in, a, in a satisfactory way, uh, the scientific image and the manifest image. Which means that even though uh, Sellers was a naturalist, so he said explicitly that when it comes to understanding the natural world, you know, the world as it is, science is the only game in town. That's it. That there's nothing else that can possibly replace it. But that does not mean that one can do a useful reduction or elimination of concepts such as normativity, uh, you know, meaning, and things like that. Those concepts uh, have to stay, not in the sense that they are some, in some kind of, sort of mystical, you know, hanging around above and beyond science or, you know, whatever uh, uh, sort of people sometimes seem to think, but just in the sense that they are irreducible to scientific discourse. Period. We cannot do without them. We, we simply cannot, and we should not try to do without them. Uh, and the way to, um, to proceed in our understanding of the world is to keep these two uh, views in, in sight, and therefore I would say uh, the aim, or a major aim of philosophy, is to see how these two things hang in together. 
You know, how is it that every new discovery of science, what kind of import does it have on, on our manifest image? Because the manifest image does change over time. You know, we don't have the same manifest image uh, the, today in the 21st century that people had, you know, a thousand years ago or two thousand years ago. That's right. Sure. That's right. Uh, but at the same time, you know, we are human beings. We're limited in understanding. We want to understand things. And so to, the idea that we can eliminate somehow talk of meaning and purpose and uh, normativity and all that sort of stuff in favors of talk of atoms and, and neural fibers uh, and things like that is just nonsense. And I, I, I think I, I think that's what Sellers is saying. And on that, I'm completely on board. What was your take? Yeah, so, so um, we probably, in order to do this... Um, well, is to, need to sort of give the definition of each uh, for him, sure. um, because because it's important to note that he emphasizes that the manifest image is not unscientific, um, sure. um, meaning that in the sense that it's not it's not necessarily unrigorous, or even it does not necessarily preclude things like enumerative induction. Right? I mean, I mean, he specifically talks about. Um, he, he, he says that um, the um, – I'll actually give you the word that he uses. Um, he says that the, um, the manifest image is subject to empirical refinement. Right. Um, and so he calls it um, – um, uh, he says under, under the heading of what he calls correlational induction. He says yeah. what really distinguishes the scientific from the manifest image is that there's nothing in the manifest image – that corresponds to the scientific uh, images use of theoretical entities. In other words, you, right. you're right that the manifest image changes, but one way in which it does not change is that it does not change by way of the introduction of theoretical entities and theoretical concepts in the way that it does in the scientific image, right? Right. Um, right. Um, and so, because I don't want people to think that the manifest image is just an ordinary folk view of the world. No. Uh, it includes a lot of philosophy, for one thing. Yes. Um, it and it includes a lot of what we would call, let's say, casual so social science in the sense. And another, I would even argue maybe that if you took social science, about half of it is work that's in the is working in the manifest image, and then the other half is at least trying to work in a sci in, in, in the scientific yeah. image. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, I think I think that's right. Uh, and in fact, one of the reasons. So uh, I found this other uh, thing right at the end of the article of the SEP article which I thought was interesting. Um, uh, he says uh, uh, that Sellers' studies are dominated by a clash between the right-wing Sellersians and the left-wing Sellersians. And, and it's interesting what the distinction is. So the right-wing is exemplified by people like the Churchlands, Ruth Milliken, and Jay Rosenberg. These are people who emphasize Sellers' scientific realism and, and nominalism. While the left wing is people like Rorty, McDowell, and, and Brendan, who emphasize instead Sellers' insistence on the irreducibility and sociality of rules and norms. That's right. And I can't believe I'm going to say this, but I find myself closer to the Rortian end of the spectrum. Yeah, we're on the left wing. Right. Yeah, <laughs> right. left wing. And, and I can say this honestly as somebody who doesn't actually have a lot, a lot of sympathy for Rorty. I think the Rorty went went you know, top down the deep end toward the end of his career with too, too much weird stuff about uh, rejecting philosophy itself and, yeah. you know, and pragmatism that wasn't really pragmatism. But nonetheless, I think he's definitely closer uh, to what I think is a sensible interpretation of Sellers than the Churchlands. I mean, when the Churchlands, you know, the classic example of uh, the, so the Churchland approach to things is that eventually neuroscience would allow us to do away with talk of mental states and pain and things like that, because pain really is, quote unquote, uh, you know, the fighting of sea fibers and things like that. Well, no, pain isn't really the, fi the, the, the fighting of sea fibers. Sea fibers are the uh, material biological basis by which we feel pain. Right. But pain is a subjective experience right. that is typical of human and other animals and not an anything else. And that needs to be described on its own on its own terms. And the two terms, of course, in fact, this is a perfect example, I think, of the stereoscopic vision. As a scientist, particularly as a biologist, I can easily switch between these two versions and say, "Oh, I'm in pain. I have this subjective state." And it, 
that description is meaningful. It, it, it need not to be eliminated. In fact, it cannot be eliminated. Right. I cannot talk sensibly. And there's certain, but, there's all sorts of modes of discourse in which that's the way you have to talk about it in order for the discourse to make sense, right? Exactly. Um, 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 where we're talking about it in the, in the scientific language, so to speak, um, would make no sense in the, in, in the, in the kind of conversation you're engaged in. Um, and that's why I think, I think it's important to note that one of the things he says about the manifest image, and I actually think this is at its heart. I mean, I mean people focus on the th point about theoretical entities, and I think that's important because I think that is a very distinctive way in which science does its business um, and is, is, is in some sense defining. But I think that really the more important element of the manifest image that distinguishes it from the scientific one is that the manifest image includes people and their point of view in it. Yeah. In other words, it's not just about the world from a neutral description, right? From a neutral vantage point. It's about the world as represented by people, right? right? And that's why it's a world that has normativity in it, that has agency. In, in, the, in the neutrally described world of science, there is no agency. That's right. There is no normativity, and there are no values. That's right. right? And, I, and I think that's why but but, but the, the the tension there i think comes out comes out uh still uh, out of the fact that even a lot of scientists uh, even today in the 21st century suffer from physics envy and and so the, the physics has been since galileo and newton you know the the paragon of science and yes it is a great science it's a great approach to reality but uh it is in fact the furthest away from the subjective point of view, from the normative point of view, and so on and so forth. What are, what are getting close, you know, biology gets closer, and then definitely the social sciences get right there. And, and that's why we have a plurality of sciences. That's why we're not going to do away with social science and reduce it to biology, and then do away with biology and reduce it to physics. It, right. it makes no, that project to me is a non starter It makes no sense. Now, let me read what the, uh, Stanford says about sellers and, and normativity. Mm -hmm. He says, uh, Norms are not reduced away in Sellers' naturalism. And it's important to, to remember that he is, in fact, a naturalist. You know, he does, he does accept science, the scientific image. He doesn't question it, he doesn't reject it. He's not a mysticist, he's not, you know, and not, nothing like that. He accommodates normativity, not as a basic, ontologically independent feature of the world, but rather as a conceptually irreducible, indispensable aspect of distinctively human activity, uh, that is, and that grounds those human activities. So that I think is a very reasonable way of looking at things. I agree, right? Yeah. Um, and, and it's it, the more I think about it this way, the more it's it's bothers it bothers me that it isn't ob painfully obvious to others. I mean, there there are people like the Churchlands or even Dan Dennett, or people uh, on who, your blog that I fight with all the time. <laughs> yes, or a number of people. On but I routinely blog. get, you have to scold me for being mean to, um, <laughs> because I don't have your stoic uh, patience. Um, yeah, but you know, on the other hand, it is kind of subtle, right? I mean, it's kind of, especially if you are brought up in a very sciencey way of looking at things. Right. Um, you don't, and, and, and you know, I think also one can, one can make a mistake the part that you read about it not being fundamental, it's not fundamental ontically, right. but it is fundamental in another sort of way, right? In, in, in other words, and maybe that way is a little hard to articulate, in that, um, look, I mean, you, you can't go below it and yeah. still be talking about what you were talking about, right? Yeah. And that's, that's why the quote that I just mentioned uses the word irreducible. Irreducible, uh, as opposed to, you know, so means that, yeah, this is the bottom level of discourse, not the bottom ontological level. We all agree that the bottom ontological level of the universe is quarks, is quarks right. or and neutrinos, or and, and or whatever the hell physicists agree, uh, you know, on, on, on today as opposed to tomorrow, what's the, 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 the basic ontological level? That is the basic ontological level. But as a level of discourse, as a level of understanding, there are some things that are simply are irreducibly conceptually that you're not going to be able to replace talk of pain with neurobiology, and you're not going to be able to replace talk of, of uh, values and normativity with fundamental physics, not even in principle. It isn't a question of, oh, well, we're not able to do it now. Right. Actually, we'll get there. No. There's, yeah. It makes no sense to even think about the fact that you could possibly do something. Like yeah, that. yeah. And, and that's because, I mean, I would argue that that's because all of these notions are only intelligible um, 
when one when one looks at the world from the point of view of agents, right? right. Um, um, right. Um, and and so and so because you can't talk about social reality, let's call it that, okay? Which yeah. includes agents and agency and thus norms and and values. Um, you can't talk about them, but from points of view, uh, um, 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 uh, it's simply you are no longer then talking about those things anymore. Um, yeah. And so, you know, if you want to talk ontologically, um, uh, you know, you know, in that sense, you know, you wonder whether there are elements of sort of social reality that are not ontologically reducible beyond a certain point. As types, right? I mean, once you get once you get below the certain point, all you can do is 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 is, is give a, 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 a let's say an animistic account of. So, so for example, I could give an animistic account of um, the motor movements uh, that are involved in my arms coming together like this and my adopting a certain posture, um, right. but I couldn't give that account of praying, right? Yeah. Right. Okay. Right. And so and so there is something irreducible there. And I don't know that it's just explanatorily irreducible. Right. Um, yeah. Once you get below a certain level, the thing you were talking about isn't there anymore. Right. The act yeah. isn't there anymore. Uh, maybe that's the difference between an action and an event. Right. Um, Perhaps. Um, right. Yeah. I, I, I hear what you're saying. I mean, I, I... The reason I don't want to go as far as saying that you know, there's sort of an ontological uh, impossibility to, to reduction or an ontological limit of redu reduction is because then you, then you need to actually articulate very carefully what, what you mean by ontological, right? So are you talking about entities? Are you talking about, uh, you know, what is it that, 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 that's going on there? And I don't think we need to. That is, in order to uh, block the, what I would, what I would uh, uh, consider sort of the scientific move, uh, which is, no, no, everything can be reduced right, right. eventually, at least in theory, uh, to science and, and, scientific and, and the scientific image. Let's put it this way. In fact, so let me get back for a second. One of the reasons I find uh, Sellers' uh, analysis interesting is because it finally makes sense for me of what is it that really bothers me about scientism, right? I mean, other than... You know, th there are sort of attitudinal aspects of scientism that bother me, right? This, this, this sort of cocky, uh, uh, you know, um, attitude of, oh, science is all the, the end of all, and it's, you know, if you're not a scientist, you're not really doing anything interesting, and so on and so forth. That, but that's a psychological thing. That just annoys me, and as, it, as you pointed out, as a stoic, I try not to get annoyed by things. Um, but that's not the problem. I, I'm trying to figure out, I've been trying to figure out for a while, uh, what, it, what exactly is it conceptually that bothers me about, about scientism? And I think Sellers provides the answer there. That is, uh, what science, scientism is trying to do, or one way to understand scientism is as the uh, program that eliminates the manifest image in favor of the scientific image. Uh, right? So that's, that's one way to, I think, a very constructive way, actually, to understand what scientism is, and I can point out to people that actually really do want to do that. An effort to replace, to re replace, in other words, to, to eliminate the manifest image and just have the scientific image, right? Correct. And there are people who are on board clearly with that program, at least in philosophy, uh, people like the Churchlands that we already mentioned. J. Uh, Rosenberg. Alex, Alex, Ro Alex Rosenberg, Rosenberg, yeah. 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 Uh, I think Dan Dennett at this point, especially after his latest thing that we might want to talk about. That consciousness is an illusion. Right, the, the consciousness as illusion kind of thing. Um, so all those people are philosophers that are, seem to be on board at this point with that kind of program. And of course, it's not difficult to find, uh, you know, physicists like Lawrence Krauss and uh, uh, and uh, and sort of associates yeah. that are the same the same board. So and and I think, however, that Sellers finally made it clear to me what is it other than the psychological aspect that bothers me about this thing, that I think there are very good reasons, and some of, several of which are spelled out by Sellers himself, for why that program is nonsensical. It's, just, it's not going to happen. This is yeah. not what you want. You don't want to have that sort of thing. It's not possible to have. You, you brought up the, the idea of sort of joining hands in, in prayer and you know, so, so that, you, that if you look at it from a, 
uh, sort of uh, independent, uh, sort of objective perspective, you cannot make sense of what's going on. I would say that goes for most human activities, right? Yes, all action. I would actually say that that's what distinguishes an action from a mere event. Okay. That an action is something that can be understood from a person's point of view, right? That makes sense from a point of view. Right. Um, so uh, I can give yeah. a description of, yeah. of every action that I do during a that I take during a particular day, right? Uh, and from an entirely physical perspective or biological perspective, if you will, or both, right? And those are, you know, sort of third-person independent, you know, view yeah. from above kind of thing, you know, non-subjective, basically, uh, descriptions. The problem is those descriptions, once, once that I reinterpret my actions during a day in terms of physics, then those actions are no different at all from anything else that's going on in the universe, from the planet Earth rotating around the sun, from a rock falling down a, a, a cliff, right. from an animal doing something or a plant doing something. There's no difference. Right. Now, if the scientific image is incapable of recovering the difference between me and a rock, then I'd say it's a problem. Yeah, and more substantially, it's a problem because all the elements of significance and meaning and value that attach to the action, attach to it, Insofar as it is an action, not insofar as it is, right? Um, you know, what makes something an act of aggression yeah. is the fact that it involves me representing you a certain way, right? Yeah. It's That's not right. that it involves uh, atoms colliding in, in, various, in various fashions. Um, right. And you could have two, uh, two, two, two things that are identical in terms of the underlying events, but yeah. one of which is an act of aggression and one which is not, right? Um, and, and unless people want to say none of that matters, right? Right. Uh, and I don't think that they do. I mean, I mean, that's that's the thing that bothers me the most is that these they, aren't, pe they these aren't are people. These aren't anarchists who want to get rid of law and morality and 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 all of these sorts oh, of things. Yeah. They think that they're just going to be able to have it all. I mean, this is Harris, right? Yeah. This sort right. of glib. I can just get rid of all of these things, but I still can keep civilization. Yeah, right. Now that's right. so they don't. Uh, they want it. They seem to be one wanting to get rid of of the uh, manifest image, in, you know, sort of a, a, as a cheaply. intellectual exercise. Cheaply, yeah. Yes, <laughs> as an intellectual exercise, but then keep all the all the stuff that actually matters in their day to day life. So here's another example. Um, uh, you know, I've been interested as a biologist for a long time into the research on the neurobiology and, and even physiology of sort of falling in love, right? So there's all these things, these talk about, oh, well, um, this, 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 there's this famous influential uh, psychologist uh, uh, who is uh, at Rutgers and Stony Brook University, Ellen Fisher, I think is her name, um, who wrote uh, lots of interesting articles about, oh, uh, you know, what happens to people typically is they fall into certain sort of phases. Um, uh, first, you know, there is lust, uh, which you have sort of almost indiscriminately toward a, you know, a, a bunch of different people. Right. And, and there's a sort of romantic involvement, which becomes you know, uh, directed at one particular person. And then if things keep going, uh, you have sort of attachment and sort of long-term uh, relationships and all that sort of stuff. And those phases are marked by different prof hormonal profiles. Uh, certain, certain hormones flood your brain when you are when you're experiencing uh, you know, sort of uh, sexual attraction towards somebody, a different set of hormones is flooding your brain or characterizing your brain patterns uh, when you're in a romantic phase or when you're in attachment. Great. Now, this is all interesting to me as a biologist, and actually it does help me make sense of the manifest image of what it is that people find, why is it people find attractive certain people, why people, you know, fall in love and all that. But if I were to go so far as saying, oh, then... Falling in love or having you know, romance or attachment is just a matter of hormonal profiles. There, I would be making a huge mistake because it isn't. It is underpinned in part physiologically by those hormonal profiles. But if I take out, if I strip out the social context, the fact that there are social expectations about how to behave with other people, and the fact that there are values that are involved in falling in love or not falling in love with a person, the fact that this adds or subtracts meaning from your life and all that, so all of that is entirely missing from a, a neurophysiological under, you know, study of right. what happens when people fall in love. That does not mean that the science is somehow irrelevant. Of course it's relevant. I like the, to know uh, you know, that part of the story. Uh, but that part of the story is not the full story. And if I think that it is the full story, then I'm missing actually the more important part.
Yeah. Because, you know, all you're saying, after all, at the end of the day, all that Adam Fisher and others are saying is that, look, when people have certain emotions, those emotions are underpinned by some kind of brain function, you know, brain machinery. Well, no kidding. Yeah. If I had no brain, I wouldn't have emotions to begin right. with. Right. right. So that's, right. that's, that's a true. consequence of us being embodied. Right. I mean, I mean, exactly. I mean, I mean, you know, that's, that's a consequence of the fact that actions involve events. Right. Um, right. um, um and that love involves physical interaction between people. Right. But uh, how else would it go? What right? makes it love is the way those people represent those physical actions, exactly. those physical events, and what the significance of those representations are. Um, which is why, although I do, I mean, you're right, of course, that the biological things do tell you something about the manifest thing. Yes. I would say that, that the reasons the person tells you tell you a lot more, right? Yes. <laughs> about agree. the love, about the love, not about the underlying correct physi physiology, uh, right. but about the love itself. Uh, yes. You know, the, the person, what the person tells you, the reasons why he loves this person, I think tell you a lot more than, 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 than the hormonal account. Um, yeah, I would agree. The, the, so. the, the, the way in which we talk and explain what happens to, uh, to our own subjective selves under those conditions uh, is much more informative. Yeah. Uh, than, than the underlying physiology, as much as I said, as I find interesting the studies about Oh, I think it's fascinating, and actually, <laughs> it just makes me amazed at just how bizarrely compli complicated the biological world is, right? I mean, yeah. I, mean um, um, I, I don't want to say it, it almost always seems to me a little Rube Goldberg-like, but... but, but yeah. I don't know, I don't know I mean, you, you're the scientist. Is, is biology actually efficient? Oh, that's a good question. Maybe we because, should go. Because, because whenever people give me arguments from design for God, I said, the thing looks like a fucking Rube Goldberg to me. That's right. right. <laughs> I, agree. I agree. And actually, I think a lot of biologists have come to see natural selection. I mean, this is, this is sort of a side uh, topic here. But, but uh, a lot of biologists come to, have come to see natural selection not as an optimizing process, but as what they call, what they call a satisfying problem, process. That it's is, good enough. You know, sort of yes, like. it's good enough. And it works on, uh, there's this famous paper that came out of, uh, uh, decades ago now uh, that uh, was uh, presenting natural selection as a tinkerer, as something that, as a process that takes whatever materials are about are around in the in the garage and puts them together in some kind of creative Which way. Which would give you a Rube Goldberg in a lot, exactly. of, a lot of times, yeah, exactly. yeah. Well, we can do another one on that. We can do another one on that. That's a good yes, one. Yes, absolutely. Good <laughs> method sellers. Uh, here's another quote that I want to um, present to our to our listeners and and take and get your take on it. This is again from the Stanford um, um, treatment of uh, the topic, which is very good as as usual, as often is the case. So he says, sellers' treatment of mentalistic concepts has also inspired eliminativist philosophies of mind, such as those espoused by the Churchlands. The idea uh, of, those, of, of that approach is that if folk psychology is like a theory, then like any theory, it could be superseded and replaced by a better theory as scientific psychology and neuroscience progresses. But Seller himself... Because it's not a scientific theory. Exactly. Uh, Seller himself, <laughs> crucially, was unmoved by this idea because the concept of folk psychology, and therefore the manifest image, are not focused solely or even maybe principally on the description and explanation of phenomena. The language of agency, to which we will shortly return in the article, is indispensable and cannot be replaced by the language of any scientific theory. So, folks, I call, I, that's something that when I studied the Churchlands in graduate school, I thought, that's odd to consider folk psychology a, a similar or equivalent to a scientific theory. It's clearly not. Yes, it does have an explanatory aspect to it, sure, um, yep. And in that sense, it has a component that is kind of theory-like. But unlike scientific theories, that's not the major work that it does. No. The major work is in terms of meaning and... Right. And, and, it, it, and yeah, no. Normativity and so on and so forth. You know, to be fair to the Churchlands, though, this is something that folk, psycholo folk psychology enthusiasts have partly brought on themselves. Because yeah. pe people like Fodor yes, have tried right. to take intentional psychology... And claim that it is causal explanatory in the matter of a the of its matter of a theory, and so then, of course, it's not a surprise that you know people who are even more science fetishistic than Fodor is are going to come along and say, "Well, but you know," and point out to all these flaws. Um, but yeah. look, I mean, this gets to an even deeper 
argument that's been going on that's sort of been swaying back and forth. You know, prior to the 1960s, reasons. So when, when I mean by reasons, I mean when we give when somebody gives a reason for an action, right? Yes. Or a reason for a belief, were not typically understood as causes, right? right. Because the influence then was Wittgenstein. Yes. That's um, right. It was Davidson who, in his very influential papers on action, argued that reasons are causes. Yeah. And that then led us into this, into this period that we're in now, um, in which reasons are taken as causes. Now, if reasons are causes, then the explanations that we give of actions, when we cite reasons, have to be taken as quasi-scientific explanations. Now, in my opinion, as I wrote in this essay that you very kindly linked to in your, in your blog, in my opinion, that just lands you right in the free will problem. And, yep. you're, and you're not going to get out of it. Yep. Um, yep. Um, and I think that it's a mistake to go that in the, there to begin with. I don't think that actions are events, or at least they're not just events. And I don't think reasons are causes in the sense that, or at least they're not just causes. Um, maybe yep. they're causes. Maybe they're not causes at all. Um, but once you, once you do, I, I, don't see, I don't see how you get out of it. Um, and you know, Sellers, something that Sellers warns against in the paper, and you, se- you use the word stereo- stereoscopic now several times, and that's crucial to him. He says, what you must never do is try to piecemeal introduce concepts from the scientific image into the manifest image. You can, you can hold them up as two holes. Here are two ways of looking at the world and ask yourself, what is the relationship between the two? Right. What you can't do is start... Bring- and I think that maybe 70% of contemporary analytic philosophy is piecemeal importing of little pieces of the scientific image. So bringing the notion from classical mechanics of a cause into psychological explanations in the sense of giving a reason for something you did yeah. is exactly well, that sort of move and it gets you nothing but trouble. I, I agree. I think that was the crucial mistake that, as you say, uh, is still reverberating in analytical philosophy and that it's leading to a lot of things that are <laughs> to use. Weird. Uh, yeah, and, and use actually then its own uh, uh, sort of classification of these kind of things. It's, it's playing mess instead of chess. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's, it's a lot of very, very clever arguments because, you know, the, 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 the Churchlands and a bunch of the other people that we mentioned, these are really seriously, serious philosophers, you know, very clever and all that sort of stuff, except that all, most of what they're saying is irrelevant because they start out with the wrong move. They, right. they made a wrong turn. And so all of that stuff, it's playing schmess, which is this uh, game, according to uh, Bennett, that is just like chess, except with one rule difference, and yeah. nobody plays it, except right. for a few people. Except for those people, yes. right, right, yeah. right. Exactly. And that's why, you know, no, look, nobody really doesn't believe that people have agency. Yeah, exactly. Um, it, that's evident from the way we speak and behave towards each other. Um, but, I th- but I think that it's not just a few philosophers that are doing it now, and scientists. There is a danger... Um, because we are increasingly, I don't know if you, if you agree with this, but we are increasingly more and more trying to medicalize behavior yeah. in a way that seems to me at least could run the risk of inducing a culture-wide loss of belief in genuine agency. Now, I don't know if you think that that's true. No, I actually am worried about that as well. That's one of the consequences of the scientific confusion of the, of, the, of the scientific versus the, the manifest image. I mean, just, just the, the typical example is all these articles, which fortunately I think have begun to subside a little bit, but there was a period of several years during which you, know, you couldn't open a magazine or a newspaper or, or a website without looking at a neural scan of a brain and, and with a title like your brain on whatever, right? Right. Uh, moral thinking and all that sort of stuff. And there was a lot of pushing. There's been a lot of pushing until until then. Later on, a little bit of pushback started. Yeah, you know, there's a couple of books out there now on on what they call neuro myths. Uh, that is, um, in fact, to be fair, a number of neuroscientists themselves have begun to push back. Are starting to push back against this. Yeah, yeah. And, and rightly so. The scientists will have to, or else it'll never get pushed back on. I mean, because nobody's right. going to listen to the philosophers who are pushing back. Okay. Right? <laughs> exactly. but, yeah, so, but that attitude does worry me because then it does present things to people. Oh, so this is your brain on morality, let's say, on moral thinking. Oh, so that means that I'm not doing the moral thinking. My brain is. Like, 
What? Right. What, what are you talking about? Right. Your brain is part of the physiological machinery by way of which you, you think, think of you, right. thinking. <laughs> but it's still you, my friend. You can't blame the damn brain for it. Right. That's right. That's right. You should put a brain riding a bicycle and a yeah. brain sort of, you know. <laughs> or a brain on writing an essay. Yeah. I say, oh, you know, the brain defense, right? Yeah. It used to be something like the twink. The Twinkie defense, yeah. I think it was called at some point. The fact yeah. that, oh, I, I had sugar, high sugar, and that made me uh, behave in a certain way. And now it's becoming you know, the brain defense. There is, in fact, an, an emerging yeah. uh, discipline of, yeah. of near neural, neural law. Or, yeah. And it's, it's really Which is terif- It's terrifying. And, and part of the reason it's terrifying is that actually I think the law is one of the areas that has resisted making this mistake. And let me give you an exa- the example I'm thinking of. Um, the legal notion of insanity is not a medical notion, right? right? So what gets you out of legal responsibility is not simply being mentally ill. It is showing that one has an inability to recognize the difference between right and wrong. Right. Now that is an intentional characterization, right? Yes. That is not a biological or a medical characterization. And I think it's telling that the law, at least as it currently stands, says you are not removed from responsibility simply for having an illness, for your body having an illness. Yeah. You have to be able to show that you, the person, don't recognize a certain crucial distinction, right? Right. right. Now, that strikes me. Which implies that there is such a thing as you, the person. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> now, I want to go back for a second yeah. to, uh, to the thing of co- uh, the talk of causality. Maybe, yes, maybe actually. Please. That should be another separate, uh, you know, you might want to take notes on all these. Yeah, reasons and causes, yeah. Yeah, Yeah. but reasons, causes, and causality more in general, because as you know, causality is a big uh, field in in philosophy, it's got it in in, in metaphysics, uh, in epistemology, there's lots of stuff about, written about causality ever since David Hume. Um, And actually, as it turns out, recently I was working on, uh, I've been working on a presentation and a book chapter that I have to to do in Vienna in a couple of months at a, in a, at a meeting about theoretical biology and philosophy. And the meeting oh, is about sweet. causality in biology. Hmm. Uh, and so I had to reread some of the basic literature on causality. And it's a mess. It's a complete mess. I mean, there's, there is, there are so many different philosophical concepts. The literature in biology is a mess? No, in philosophy. In philosophy, okay. Yeah. 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 I mean, biologists usually don't, don't think too much about it. They just use the word cause in a sort of a intuitive fashion. Um, and you know they say you know this this phenomenon caused that or or that um, that kind of uh, action by a particular organism caused that sort of thing. Yeah. Uh, but but in in philosophy there are many many different ca- accounts of of causality, uh, several of which are completely decoupled as far as I can tell from anything that's going on in the sciences. I mean a scientist wouldn't recognize some of many of these accounts as anything to do with what they're doing. And it strikes it struck me as uh, probably what's going on there is that causality actually refers to a multiplicity of things, and that should be kept distinct, and we should be using different words for it, which is, I think, why there is so much confusion about, well, are reason causes or not? Reasons are certainly explanation for behaviors. Right. Right. And if by cause you mean something like explanations, right. then, then it's a cause, right? Then but it's, it's not a cause. a cause in the sense of a cause in classical mechanics. Exactly. Yeah. So, you know, yeah. one of the popular um, understanding of causes, which I actually have a lot of sympathy for, uh, is, is clearly based on physics. And it is that a cause, you know, a causal interaction basically is a transferring of a conserved uh, quantity from one object to another. Right, so conserved quantities are things like energy, momentum, things like that. Right, so yeah, I could say that if I bang my uh, my fist on, on my desk at this moment, what it's happening there, you know, I'm causing a noise and I'm causing a vibration. And yes, that cause can be described very nicely as a transference of uh, conserved uh, uh, quantities, physical quantities, from my body to the desk. Absolutely. That is, in fact, a very good description of what's going on there. Right. Now, try to translate that to uh, the reason or cause why Massimo last night uh, went out to dinner after the movie is because he wanted to enjoy a nice meal uh, with his companion. No, that's no. in terms of 
of conserved quantities that somehow changed <laughs> your bodies. It's like, no, that's a no starter. Right. right. That's not what you're talking about. Right. But now, does that mean that my, my behavior then was uncaused? That, that, you know, that had no reasons for doing what I did? Of course I did. But those reasons are actually not describable in terms of causality understood in that particular physicalist way. That's not to say, of course, there was something non-physical going on there. Right. As you know, I'm a materialist. Right. I don't believe in non-physical. And stuff. even though a lot of the underlying motor movements involved were caused in precisely the way that you're talking about, but the act of going to the dinner was not yeah. caused in that way. Correct. And unless you want to say there are no acts of going to dinner, right? <laughs> which which you almost wonder whether right? It's an illusion, right? I mean, you can't even believe people say these things as they're doing things. Yeah. Right? I mean... Which brings us to Dennett. Come on. I think we should talk about Dennett. So, so here's the thing that struck me. I want to hear... This is this book. recent book that Dennett wrote that's just right. been reviewed by Thomas Nagel in the New York Review of Books, right. which we will link to. I don't think it's behind a paywall, so we'll link to it. No, not anymore. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. When it came out, but not anymore. So, you know, Nagel and Dennett... Let me, let me step back for a second here. Nagel and Dennett are two interesting characters as far as I personally am concerned. Uh, uh, I actually think they're both very, very interesting philosophers. I think they are seriously mistaken for different reasons. I mean, when I when I uh, read uh, Nagel's latest Nagel's own latest book, um, which I, I forgot the title it was of Mind it. and Cosmos. Yeah, yeah. right. Yeah. Which which you we just, can link you, to yeah. as well. Um, you know, that one also struck me as seriously misguiding in sort of the opposite way in which Dennett. Yeah. Like, Did you do a review of that? that? Was that? Did you no, I didn't review it formally. I think okay. I wrote something about it in a, in a blog post. Okay. Um, but in fact, I think actually one good good um, way of understanding the, the discrepancy and differences in the opposition between Dennett and Nagel is that to some extent, and I don't want to oversimplify uh, what they're doing, but to some extent I think Nagel is too far on the wedded to the, to the uh, manifest image and too skeptical of the scientific one. And, and Dennett is exactly the opposite. He's, he's going... Full, full reductionist at this point on the scientific uh, image and, and sort of ignoring uh, or dismissing as an illusion uh, much of the manifest image. But so um, what Dennett was doing in this latest book uh, is, you know, sort of articulating uh, his idea that consciousness is, quote-unquote, an illusion. Now, uh, what the hell does he mean by that? Uh, so, so some of the commenters already on the blog, the blog post um, uh, my footnotes to, to you're already annoyed you're already annoyed and it's only the first day which is what That's i right. find so funny <laughs> it's it just came out today and it wasn't even a post as you know it was just a, a series of links to articles that are interested to read for a weekend and yet that generated a, a lot of comments already um some of those comments are on the lines of well let's see what what does it mean to have an illusion so an illusion broadly speaking can be simply a misperception of what's going on right um well that's not, I think, that is not what Dennett means. Because no, that's not interesting at all. In, it's not interesting <laughs> at all. Because at that level, everything pretty much becomes an illusion. You know, so right now, for instance, I'm looking at you through a computer screen, through an, a screen of my, my iPad. But in fact, of course, all of this is an illusion. It's all electrons that are put together in a particular way by the underlying mechanism of the, of the iPad, right? So, so the, I'm looking at an illusion it's in a... In a Broad sense of the term, but that's not helpful at all. Nobody right. would be, uh, you know, uh, first you don't get any explanatory insight when you say that right. I'm looking in an illusion right now, and second of all, nobody would disagree. Yes, of course, in that sense, it is an illusion, but it's not useful. What then it actually says uh, comes out by by way of one of these analogies. He says that consciousness is uh, a lot like. The, those little uh, icons of folders that you have on a desktop computer, right? So those folders. So you look at if you, if you if you're a user of a computer, you have these folders um, is uh, on the on your desktop, and you click on them, and they open just as if they were folders. And then inside, quote unquote, there's stuff that you can look at and transfer, copy, and so on and so forth, right? But of course, that really is an illusion. There's nothing like a folder. There is no inside. There's no, there's no inside. It's not an actual container, right? right. <laughs> it's not a container. There's nothing inside. Uh, and, and therefore, that really qualifies as an illusion. Right. right? It's a useful illusion because it's, it's something that allows me to move uh, things uh, and to operate with things on my computer. But that really is, in fact, an illusion. But to say that consciousness is like that, 
Uh, to quote uh, a famous uh, phrase by uh, John C. Arl, uh, he of the Chinese room, yeah. uh, is like that's denying the data. The yeah. data there is that, of course, it's consciousness. I am conscious right now. That's what I we're know. trying to explain. Right. right. <laughs> that's what you need to explain, right? If you say that that's an illusion because, you know, really what it is is some kind of neural machinery at the bottom, you're not saying anything. You're really not telling yeah. me anything that I don't know. Yes, of course, there is some. You're just dodging the. You're, you're just saying, I refuse to explain it, is what you're really right. saying. Right. Right. You're saying, well, uh, I understand that there is a neural machinery at the bottom that, that makes consciousness possible. The question is, how does that work? Uh, and you don't say, you don't explain how it works by telling me that not really, this is not happening. Similarly, of course, we talked earlier about the, the Churchland's approach to pain in terms of C fibers, right? It's telling me that pain is really the C fibers of my neurons, you know, firing. It's not making pain go away. It's right. not that, that pain is an illusion. I have an undeniable, irreducible right. experience of pain right. under certain circumstances, and that's not going to go away. It's not an illusion. It's a perfectly valid description of a psychological state, of a subjective state. If you tell me, yes, but what's really going on is that certain particular neurons made in a particular way are firing and your, your brain is responding a certain way, I would say... That is not what is really going on. That is a part of what's going yes, on. That is, yes. That's the physical yeah. substrate yeah. that makes it possible for me to feel pain. Yeah, yeah. So let me ask you this then, because this, this brings us back to sellers. Um, all that really talk yeah. is a way of expressing the view that the scientific image is primary. Right. And... Sellers, at least the, the general consensus is that sellers thought that in an important way the scientific image was primary, but nonetheless insisted on ultimately a synoptic vision that included both the scientific and the manifest image. Now, I don't think it matters as much what sellers meant by it as what we can do with it. Sure. Um, it seems to me impossible to say that one or the other is primary in any absolute sense. It seems to me that the only, way, the only sense you can make of anything being primary is relative to a set of interests or relative to a frame of reference. Yes. Are you of that view also, or do you think there is a way in which the scientific image is properly primary? No, I don't think there is. Uh, and I think that actually Sellers, from what I understand, I mean, I'm not a Sellers scholar, of course, but, but from what I, my understanding is that Sellers wouldn't say that a scientific image is primary in an absolute sense. What it is, is if your goal is to understand at bottom, how the world works mechanistically, then the way to go is the scientific image. If I want to know how galaxies are put together, how human beings uh, evolved, how you know anything else physical happens in the world, then yes, the scientific image is the way to go because that gives the a better description, not the correct description, because it's a, it's still a description. You know, we we keep forgetting that science is still a human activity and therefore it's bounded by human rationality, uh, human epistemic limitations, and so on and so forth. But nonetheless. If, I, if my goal is to understand how the world works, uh, yes, that, then the scientific image is primary. Uh, but if my goal is to interact with other people in a meaningful way, to run my life, to, make prior, to, to, to establish priorities, uh, to have social relations, uh, to engage in normative uh, statements and so on and so forth, then the scientific image is not primary. Um, it tells me very little. It just gives me background information, you know, like, like the example of the... Uh, neural, uh, sorry, the um, the patterns in my brain that are going on when I fall in love. Yes, but that's secondary. That's just a curiosity. Yeah. Uh, you know, it's not like I go out with somebody and I develop a relationship and I keep thinking, well, you know, certain hormones in my are flooding my brain right now. That that tells me not, that's a curiosity. That's just a parlor uh, thing. It's like uh, not a trick, but it, but it, it's a it's a conversation that we can have uh, over dinner. But that is no in no way influences the way in which I interact with other people. So if the goal is to interact with other people, to choose goals for your life, to figure out where meaning in your life goes, comes from, and so on and so forth, priorities and all that sort of stuff that make the fabric of a human life, then I think the, the, the manifest image is primary, not the, not the scientific one. So that's why I like the idea of this stereoscopic vision. Yeah. Now, here's, here's another way in which the, I was surprised, but it actually makes some sense to me. Uh, here's another way in which the Stanford article puts it. Um, it says, 
that the distinction between the scientific image and the, and the um, manifest image is analogous to Kant's distinction between the phenomenal and the noumenal. Yeah. And, um, and it's kind of interesting because, of course, Kant would say, well, yeah, but we don't have any access to the noumenal. Right. Uh, but so that's not the sense in which it's analogous, I don't think. I mean, it's, it's analogous in the sense that the noumenal is the world as not, re not as represented, right? Correct. Right. It, the world in, as it is in itself without representation, right? From a neutral yeah. point, the way we put it is from a non-personal point of view, from, from a neutral perspective. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. And I find that very useful. Uh, I find that very, very, uh, very appealing, again, because, and, and especially as a scientist philosopher, I really appreciate this, this idea of this, the stereoscopic vision because I do like the, the idea that I'm able to switch back and forth and then integrate also, whenever it's necessary and whenever it's useful, uh, the, the two images. Because as we were saying earlier, sometimes the scientific image does in fact influence the manifest image. I mean, we change our uh, view of the world in part as a result uh, of major insights uh, from science, right? I mean, once that science, for instance, demonstrated uh, that the universe is much, much larger than we thought, you know, let's, people, don't, people forget that galaxies were not discovered until the early part of the uh, 20th century. Which is amazing. You realize how, how recent right. most of our understanding is, right? I mean, I mean yeah. Right. Now, but once so we thought there was just one galaxy? Yeah, we, we, we thought it was just one. The universe was, was the Milky Way galaxy. Yeah, it was yeah. stars and things. But, but you know, these, these nebulae, they were called nebulae originally. And they were thought to be intragalactic objects. It was only in the early, I think, in the 1920s, uh, with research by Hubble and others, that it, was, it became clear that these actually are actually very, very distant, far, far, far more yeah. distant. And they are, in fact, things just like our Milky Way. Now, that seems to me did change or should change my manifest image. Uh, because now I feel part of a much broader cosmos, much larger cosmos, and right. that does change the way in which I sort of broadly think about things. Oh, so it changes I, the way you represent everything, it seems to me. I mean, right. it even affects the, 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 the significance you attach to things, and, and, right. and, and uh, yeah, no, I agree with that. Um, do you think it goes the other way, though? I mean, maybe some of the reason why people think, and I'm not, I'm not talking about crude scientismists, but more thoughtful people, think that there's a certain pri primacy to the scientific image is because while the scientific image can inform the manifest image, perhaps they think that it can't go the other way. Then the manifest image does not ever inform the scientific image. Now, what do you think of that? I mean, do you think the manifest image ever informs the scientific image? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, I'm not sure that the that the manifest image informs the scientific image as much as it puts constraints on it. And I, think I agree actually, with that. Right? Yes. I think actually you can find that in, in, in Sellers. Um, yeah, he says, he says, look, without a manifest image, there would be no scientific image. So in a sense, right. genealogically right. and methodologically, the scientific image is dependent upon the manifest. Um, right. But it purports to give an independent account of all of reality, um, at least all of reality from no perspective, so to speak. Um, and, and here's one way yeah. this happens. So, yeah. let's, so let's take, uh, let, let, let me give you one example. Let's take quantum mechanics, which is, you know, the quintessential, you know, a, a, a example of scientific image of the world, right? The quantum world is so weird and all that. In fact, it is very weird, uh, but we have trouble, and because of that weirdness, we have trouble uh, understanding it uh, beyond sort of the calculation, right? So there's, there's a whole... There's a whole uh, um, school of thought in, in fundamental physics that sort of eschews any interpretation of quantum mechanics, and it's referred to often jokingly as the "shut up and calculate" school, right? That that you know quantum mechanics is a mathematical theory, and all you need to do with it is to plug in the numbers, and it gives you very precise. Uh, you but know, that these interpretations are in a sense fantasies. Right, their interpretations yeah. are metaphysics, yeah. they're unnecessary, and they're certainly... That seems kind of credible, don't you think? What was that? That seems credible, don't you think? It is credible. Now, the problem is that a lot of scientists just are not happy with that. Why are they not happy with that? Because they want to understand the world, not just to describe it. Right? Science isn't just in the business of making predictions, let's say experimental predictions. Yeah. Because if that were the case, then we could just all do statistics. 
you know, with no understanding of underlying causality, no understanding right. of... So know, it's almost like they want, they want to bring it into the manifest image. They want to be able to understand it. They want to be able to represent it. Exactly. Yeah. Which is why we get all these discussions about, you know, metaphors to understand... Many one. worlds... And yeah, well, yeah, or yeah. even more simply, oh, light is both a particle and a wave. That is an attempt to reduce the scientific image to the manifest image because yeah. we, can, we can think about particles. They're metaphors. They're metaphors. Um, we can think about particles and, and about waves. We can't think about what light actually is. Light is neither a particle nor a wave. It's something else. It's its, its own thing that behaves in, in very precise and very, uh, you know, clearly understood way. From That's a really mechanical perspective, but in terms of metaphor, we are we keep insisting in using metaphors. We cannot do without metaphors because I mean, we people just, do science, right? Exactly. And science is an activity, <laughs> right? We cannot do without metaphors, right. even in science, right? Right. So genes as blueprints, for instance, which I think it's actually a flawed metaphor, but but again, it's a metaphor because it's really interesting. So you're 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 saying that. If you wanted to see what science would look like, if it wasn't being in some ways interpreted in terms of the manifest image, it would just be pure statistics, is what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, or pure math. Yeah, that's right. Uh, there will be no interpretation. As soon as you bring that's in... so the, interesting. What you're doing is to bring... You have to bring in metaphorical language. And why do, what do you want to do that? Because we're human beings. We want to understand things. We don't just want to describe things. We that's don't right. want things... You know, we don't have an instrumental view of science only. Yes, science is also instrumental, of course. But we want to understand. You don't get, you know, when I got into science as a young, uh, in, you know, um, um, kid growing up in, in, in Italy, I didn't get into it because so I could make very precise predictions about uh, things in the world. I got into it because I wanted to understand things, to make sense of things. Yeah. But to understand and to make sense means that to some extent you have to reconcile the scientific right. and it involves <laughs> interpreting the, it involves interpreting the material that you that you're that you're and the only about. interpretations we can do are in terms of this of the manifest image yeah because that's how we think that, that right that, yeah yeah so i guess no the only way to do science any other way was to have machines do them right right exactly so when a computer when, when we hand over tasks to a computer sure um Sure. But and you know, the, still the we yeah. interpret the we interpret what the, the what the computer then tells us, right? I mean, right. it's still science for someone, right? Exactly. Uh, <laughs> and I think therefore That's good that stuff. it is true that I think it's fair to say that the scientific image constantly influences and hopefully updates the manifest image. I don't think the manifest image does the same, but what the manifest image does is it constrains the way in which we make sense of the scientific image. Yeah, it, it, it does it in a different way. I mean, they both affect each other. I mean, the, the scientific image actually con contributes information yeah. to the, that the manifest image can make use of, although it has to be careful not to do these sort of piecemeal importings of right. notions like mechanistic causality over into human action, let's say. Right. But what the, but the manifest image does it is it's the frame in which we interpret everything that we find that we discover by exactly. way of science, uh, and, and thus we make cannot, it meaningful to us. <laughs> yes, exactly. And we cannot do without it because we're human beings, uh, and human beings uh, want to understand things and and put a meaning to it. Yeah, yeah. Meaning, understanding, values, all those stuff. Those are part. Those are those yeah. are within the manifest image, not the scientific image. Yeah. They don't enter into the scientific. Yeah. It's interesting, I realize now, and I don't know whether even you realized it because you say it so often, if you realize that, it, that this was the point, the, and that is, I can't say how many times I've heard you say to people that science is a human activity. Right. <laughs> and I wonder if, if even you realized the full like, resonance of what that meant when you say no. that to people, right? I mean, yeah. not, not until, not, as I said, not until I started thinking in terms of Sellers. I mean, Sellers has now become one of my favorite philosophers. Uh, you know, of the yeah, this century. paper is just amazing um, um, for that yeah. reason. Yeah, yeah, it, yeah. It helped me make sense of a lot of things that I had some kind of intuitions about it and I felt some discomfort about it, but it, I, I was missing the general uh, overarching sort of tip, uh, framework yeah. Yeah. to make sense of them, and and now I think I have them, and I hope our our uh, uh, listeners and you know uh, w will actually go out and check at least the the Stanford article, and and if not, as you say, the paper is hard, but I don't think it's unreadable for an educator. And if you read it with the Stanford article, I think you can probably get through it pretty well. Yeah. Um, 
Well, this is really fascinating. This is really good stuff, Massimo, and um, I appreciate it very much. And um, uh, we had to postpone a taping. Uh, we're going to do a, another one that's going to be with that Massimo and another person, uh, Sky Cleary, yes. um, uh, on the subject of stoicism and existentialism. We had some, tech and I'm going to be moderating as a disembodied voice, so you won't <laughs> have to look at this going. Right. <laughs> um, um, but one of my students actually told me it was cute, which sort of bolstered me a little bit because she was quite attractive um, um, <laughs> and 20. Um, um, but uh, so that we're going to be doing that on Monday. Yes. Uh, oh, no, Tuesday. Tuesday, excuse me. Oh, yeah. Um, so and so come out soon. That'll, that'll go up not too long after this one. And your book is, is going to be out. May 9th. May 9th. Um, so that's. Uh, that's How to be a star. Go pre order it. Yes. Please. Damn it! <laughs> um, it was actually, I checked the other day. Uh, how many are you? Uh, how are the pre-orders? Yeah, num it was number one uh, new release in Greek and Roman philosophy, so on Amazon. So yes, if people keep uh, pre-ordering it, then it will keep it there, which helps. Yeah, I'm told by my publisher that pre-orders now are actually crucial to make or break it for a book because if there is enough pre-orders, then people start paying attention. It gets high on the rankings, reviewers paying attention. People start talking book. about it and sort of, yeah, yeah. Great. Well, well, we'll be sure to talk about that when it comes out. Absolutely. All right, Massimo, take care of yourself. You too. Thank All right, you. talk to Bye. you soon.